welcome to the making of Tararua SK, where we're going to uh, take you behind the scenes uh, of our award-winning adventure documentary. I'm Andy. I'm the filmmaker, cameraman, narrator, distributor, uh, and orange boy. And I'm Hans, filmmaker, cameraman, film coach, and editor. Together, we'll break down the highs, the lows, and all the wild moments that went into creating Tararua SK. Really cool to have this opportunity to sit down and chat about the making of our film, which for me was has been an incredible experience over the, the last few years. So really keen to just break down some of the highs and lows and and to provide some of our audience an insight into what went on over those over these last two years. I guess going back to where it all started, we've got the amazing Tararua range and for me, my first kind of real experience around the Tararua Range was it's probably 15 years ago. I entered the Tararua Mountain Race, which is a uh, just a wild adventure running race that runs over the Southern Crossing, which is from Kaitoki to to Otaki. I signed up for the race, and the first time you do it, you have to do it with somebody. You're not allowed to enter it just by yourself. And so my brother-in-law, who was, who was a keen tramper and runner, he, he agreed to, to do it with me. And we went on this, we went on this like reconnaissance trip or like test trip because you had to have done the route before. And I took uh, one of my friends who was a keen runner and keen outdoor guy. And we just, it was the most harrowing trip like it was in December, it snowed, it was such, so brutal and so much hard work. My my friend who came with us still talks about it as being one of the most horrendous days of his life. Wow. <laughs> Before that though, what attracted you to get into the, to the Rangers? Was it the race? Yeah, so that was really the first time that I'd been into the range since I was a kid. Yeah, so I hadn't tramping as many of us do with school groups in the range, but yeah, since then I hadn't been in there. So. Wow. And so you, you were talking about it being a harrow, that most harrowing day of his life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't put, yeah, so what, what was the outcome of that? So the race was a couple of months later, and my brother-in-law, uh, Neil, and I, we had this amazing day out this great adventure and like really hard but yeah but amazing and yeah so that was that was the first one that you sounds like you guys you got the bug you got bit after that like that was the beginning of many adventures yeah yeah that was so over the next so every couple of years the Tararua mountain race ran over that route, which was on spectacular, where you actually get onto the tops and you get the real magic of the Tararua range. And a few years later, I think it might have been, I'm not sure if it was my second or third time that I ran in the race. I, by that stage, I had my GoPro and I recorded, I grabbed some clips from actually doing the race and put together a little three minute kind of smash up of some clips to some music. And yeah, that was yeah, so that was the first footage that I shot in the, the Tararua range. And was that the first film you'd made of, of your adventures? No. Oh. By that stage I'd been making uh, little films uh, of some other adventures, mainly the the great walk. So two mates and I, we had this little challenge to go and run all of the great walks in New Zealand. And I got a GoPro camera, I think, you know, for my second or third one of those that we did. And so I'd made these little three or four minute little videos from those adventures. And that was, that was really the start of me making some little 
videos. Do those have narration over them, or are they just music and pictures? They were just music. Yeah. 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 And yeah, they were, they were pretty basic, you know. Yeah. But it was fun, and it was my motivation behind that was I really wanted to share these beautiful places with my friends and family. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so you had a lot of adventures in the Tarara Ranges before you even began making, thinking about making a film. Yeah. Particularly the races, I suppose. But then you learned about the, through, through your journey, you learned about the, the SK Traverse and the different yeah. challenges. Yeah. So not long, not long after making that first little video of the race, I came across the mountain running community in Wellington. And I started reading about the SK and it just completely blew my mind. And by that stage, we'd run these great walks. We're looking for what's next. And there were these trip reports about the SK and also other routes in the Tararoa. And I was really it was amazing timing because it, it was like within a few months of me meeting up with this group and starting to join in on some of their runs and read about some of their adventures. They were having the first ever SK Awards night and I managed to wrangle my way into coming along and I offered to video record the event. And this, some of the footage in the film is from that very first awards night. And being, you know, after reading the trip reports, which were just they were like these incredible adventure stories, to then being there at that awards night. And I know for me, and I, I'm sure for many others in the room, if you hadn't done an SK by that stage, you were, I was like, it was only a matter of when you were going to try because was so motivating and inspiring being in that room hearing everybody talk about their adventures on the range do you remember what anything what it was in particular that really drew you to reading the trip reports and people retelling their adventures at the awards night was it was what was in what was in, from those in particular that really grabbed you it, it was this heart and spirit of adventure it, it was just People pushing themselves and doing just something really crazy and out there in a really wild environment. There's being uh, traversing the length of a range where, you know, for a good portion of it, there's no track. There's just a route and it's just, it's wild and it's beautiful. The pictures you'd see and, and, People trying to do it in a single push, which is the six-day full-on advanced tramp. And people are trying to do it in a single push. And the first trip reports I was reading, like the kind of the standard start time was at four or five o'clock in the morning. See, people are going and staying up near Ekerahuna, Patara, the road end, sleeping in the backs of their cars or sleeping in a tent on the side of the road, getting up at four o'clock in the morning, putting on the headlamps and just trying to traverse this whole length of the range. And the elite runners were doing it in under 24 hours. And yeah, yeah it was just that whole Amazing. adventurous spirit was just, it was captivating. Yeah. And so you had the options, people have the options of doing different length traverses. So you've got your dat, you've got your twenty four hour one, the elite runners, you've got the forty eight hour and then the three day. Is that right? The history behind the the route is that back in the sixties, the tramping clubs created this weekend challenge where you'd leave work on Friday night and you'd you'd catch the train up to Ikarahuna and then you'd start You'd tramp into the first hut, stay the night, and then try and complete the length of the range over over the weekend and get back in time for work for Monday morning. And yeah, then over the years it morphed into, from a very early stage, people were 
wanting to know whether they could do it in a single push and do it in under 24 hours. And I think 1995, Colin Ralph did that. He was the first to do that. Yeah. So after the awards night, hearing about this, I planned my first attempt. Uh, and at the end of that year, often you people plan attempts on the longest, close to the longest day of the year. So you've got as much light as possible. So you've got less time in the dark. And so that was, that's always in December. So in December we had the, the first attempt and yeah, and I got about eight hours in and badly sprained my ankle and yeah, had to hobble out. Yeah. Yeah. Gee. Yeah. yeah. But that didn't stop you. <laughs> no. But did you... Was it a couple of years later that you did you, you had your second attempt? So yeah. Yeah. that that required a bit of considering getting yourself back up to the was it a fitness level thing as well? Like being ready for it fitness wise. What, what kind of things do you need to do to keep yourself? You can't just run in there on a. Yeah, there's definitely a massive kind of fitness component. There's also quite a lot of logistics as well to. You've got to find you've got to find a weather window, and that's really hard in the range. Mm, yeah, you have, to, you have to do that, and then you've got to find some time where you're where you can be flexible to fit in with the weather window. Yeah, it it, it took a little bit. That kind of all takes a bit, and it also takes a fair bit of mental motivation to put yourself into that situation, which is. Yeah, that's hard. It's it's a hard thing to do. Yes, a second attempt with my mate Anthony. It was about a year and a bit after the first attempt, and we were very late in the season. We wanted to get this in, wanted to try and complete the the route before winter came, and so yeah, that meant we we had a change of approach. We tried starting at nine o'clock at night instead of first thing in the morning and yeah and that didn't go very well we got just over halfway and yeah completely physically and mentally broken was that the one where you, you had to sleep outdoors at night uh, so no, no we didn't no we didn't but we traveled first seven hours in the dark and, we got, and, th- and this is a place where there's no tracks. A lot. Yeah. So was that going through areas where there weren't any tracks? Yeah, we got lost yeah. for a while. Wow. Yeah. In the dark, mm. and, and the clag, and yeah. Wow. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you're using um, GPS, and you know, you've got your what, what do you call it, Garmin or? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I still managed to get lost even yeah, with yeah. that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, yeah, and the interesting thing is though, like all these adventures you're going on, mm. you were pretty much filming. All, you were taking a GoPro along on most of them or all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the time, from that time of that first mountain race, through to when we made the film, you know, I counted up. There was like seventeen different adventures that I'd gone on in the range with my mates. And had filmed footage and put together little short videos, mainly just to music, of of our time in the range. And yeah, I had a lot, lots of beautiful footage across all of the different seasons in in the range. So we had snow snowy trips and uh, summer trips and yeah. And I guess, yeah, without knowing it, you'd already started making the film a decade ago or longer. Yeah. 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 As as my wife says, when you ask the question, how long did it take you to make the film? She would say 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be accurate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's so good that you did take the time to film all these adventures. And, and just to circle back to that trip that you got the helicopter out on. Mm. Yeah, that, so that was captured. You'd captured that as well. I think we've used your some of that adventure in the film it's in the helicopter shot, yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, you were capturing everything as you were going there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. And yeah, and so I think it was, yeah, you, so you failed too. Yeah. And how did you feel after that second failure? It was really hard. And yeah, I'd never, I don't know, it felt really 
like something I'd never experienced to that degree before. Like I'd failed at lots of different stuff, but had never had kind of something that had broken me as much mentally. And that was a really disconcerting experience. And yeah, it was really... Did you give up? Was it a, had you given up at that point? or? Yeah, I think I had given up. I doing doing the SK as a as a single push is like it's a very hard physical and mental thing to do. And for me, I'm not a I'm not an elite runner like many of the people that I was reading about or the people that I would I was hanging out with in the mountain running community. I was it was a survival thing and yeah, you know, and it was breaking me. <laughs> so, yeah, that's where reading David Goggins' book "Can't Hurt Me," mm. who and that was really pivotal because there's there was a really amazing lesson in there mm. about how when you face adversity, how to go through and debrief that so that you are actually dealing with the facts of what happened and and every time you face challenge there there's always some things that you could have done better but there's also always a bunch of things that you've done well and it's really easy mentally to get into a spiral mm. a negative spiral because you wanted to do something and you couldn't do it or you didn't do it and so that really helped me identify, okay, what are the things that I did well that worked? Okay, and there were quite a lot of those things. What were some of the things that I did wrong and that I could do better next time? And there were a bunch of those. And so that helped me break it down to give me the really the motivation to go and try again. Right, yeah. It's so easy to just to dwell on the... Your feelings uh, that you felt afterwards, the negative feelings, and yeah. you forget about all the great wins and successes you had along the way and, and, and ways you could improve them. And is there something else he talks about? I haven't read his book, but I've heard that it's, he talk, also talks about separating the physical from the mental. Is that true? Yep. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, did that mind, does that help when you're, <laughs> when you're up against it in the ranges to like the. Okay, my body can still go, but my mind's giving up. So is that what he means? Or? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's yeah, there's a huge amount around that. And yeah, our bodies are capable of far more than our mind is capable of. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I'm just having a look at my notes. Yeah, cool. So yeah, look, you did seventeen. So you did seventeen trips with your GoPro. I didn't realize you'd done seventeen. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's why there was so many you cl so many GoPro clips for you to yeah. review, Hans. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was a delight. And I, I suppose we'll we'll get into that, won't we? Cause we will. But that yeah. was yeah, that was fundamental for the film. Yeah, absolutely fundamental. Okay, so you completed your first SK, and that was solo. No, no. So. There were, there were four of us that started out together and one of my mates didn't have enough time to do, so he just came for the first four hours or so with us and then turned back and uh, went back. So he you know, dropped us at the road end and then the three of us continued and yeah, I got to a point where I needed to stop for a couple of hours to... Yeah, I was just physically broken, so I just needed to recover and get some food and just have a little bit of a rest. My other uh, two friends, they continued, and and they, yeah, quite a few hours later, I stumbled in, <laughs> completing mine. Yeah, into that into that uh, car park, the, the, the car park of glory, the car park of glory. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the clip in the film is you looking pretty shattered, but you managed to film yourself. Yeah. And you've got nothing to say. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> I think it must have taken a bit of effort to even turn the camera on at that point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It took a lot of effort yeah. to get 
get down those last few hours mm. down that Marchant Ridge. Yeah, it was yeah. a big. It was a big day. And that's uh, one of the. Uh, I think is it Gary in the film who talks about Marchant Ridge. Yeah. So it's obviously the. Uh, that's a testing part of the SK. Yeah, it's kind of the last big stretch, mm. and yeah, and it's not flat, as none of the roof route is flat, and you hope that it would be a little bit more downhill than what it is. So, yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough long ridge. Yeah, yeah. when you're when you're exhausted <laughs> and you've been going for many hours. But at that point, you can't really stop because you've got you stop. You just you just got to keep going and yeah, yeah, push through it. Yeah, push through the hardship. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, so you completed that, and then you know, how did you feel? Oh, look, I was absolutely, I, I was thrilled. Like I was mm. really thrilled to finally complete it. I go mentally, it was like a massive relief to have had this goal, failed twice and to finally get there. It was a massive it was a massive relief. <laughs> and I felt really sore. Like I was exa- absolutely exhausted. I think it took took me quite a few weeks to recover. It was Christmas holidays, so that was really nice. I just hung out at the beach and went swimming and and yeah, recovered. But it must have been great to finally realise or understand or feel like what everyone else had. Going back to the trip reports you'd read on the awards evening and being able to, you must have finally understood the pull of the SK. Yeah, it was immensely satisfying to finally complete it. Yeah, it was very cool. And so then you, so you completed that in 2019 and then I suppose that takes us into the, Starting to come to the filmmaking part of the story. Yeah. Sorry, my papers are probably making lots of sound, so I'll start that again. Yeah, so at some point after finishing completing the SK, and oh, I have to ask, did you do it again? And that, apart from what we'll talk about soon. No. You to, no, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Took that one off. <laughs> you didn't go back the next week, obviously. No. no. <laughs> yeah, but at some point you thought, what, mate, what was the. We, you just you wanted to make a film about the Tararua. SK. So how did you, where did you get the idea or what inspired you to, to make what was made? Okay. So it probably, go, it probably goes back 10 years and I went to my first mountain film festival and I watched this selection of incredible short films of people out adventuring and it was they were beautiful they were inspiring and kind of created this little dream that man one day I'd love to make a film like that inspired people to go on adventures and you know so that was at the time where I was early days playing with my GoPro and making my little videos from my adventures. And yeah, then over the years of making those, I started to become a little kind of frustrated that I would make these little collections of clips, put some music to it, and they weren't, like they weren't very inspiring. They were beautiful. There was a whole element missing. Yeah, so I I started I started to look at and see what courses I could do to to get better at making little uh, videos of my adventures, and it was the first courses that I did was recommended by you when when we first met, which was when we got introduced by Dave and that's right yes yeah. and you were looking for. Yeah, we got introduced through my business, mm. which is providing business coaching and technology services to to help businesses. Mm. 
and yeah, Dave introduced us and we did some work together and and we talked about filmmaking. Yeah. Which was great. And you recommended I do that muse storytelling mm, yes, course. Yes. And so that was fantastic. That kind yeah. of taught me some basics about storytelling. Yeah. And I then signed up to go and do the adventure film school that's run by the New Zealand Mountain Film Festival. And and that was doing those two courses really gave me a whole pile of help to go, okay, this is the path to making making something more interesting than what I was making. Yeah. And yeah. And after doing the, so while doing the Adventure Film School, the question comes up, what would you like to make a film about? And the thing, one of the things that kind of kept getting drilled into us at the Adventure Film School is just that story is everything. And you have to find the the heart and spirit or the emotion inside of that story mm. to to have something which is going to inspire people and is going to connect with people. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it seems you knew there was a story to tell. <laughs> and that seemed to be why you were capturing footage along the way, even if it was more in a, for just a one-off video way. But you got through all your adventures You and the getting involved in the SK community. It sounds like you, you really understood the heart and soul of it and the emotion of it. But it was a, more of a case of, okay, I've got all this footage how do I tell a story? And so then, so getting to the festival and being inspired from that and then learning about storytelling must have been like a piece of the puzzle coming together or... Yeah. Yeah. To, just talk us through that. After doing, after going to the Adventure Film School, I was thinking about what's a, what's a, what's an, a really interesting, inspiring story that, that I could tell. And the SK came up as, as an idea. And I, to me, the SK was something that was really inspiring and really engaging for me. It had all of these layers of depth inside of the story. It had all of this incredible history. It had this beautiful ad adventure element. There was this whole community spirit around it there were there was the sk book there were all of these trip reports there were the awards nights there was yeah so there was all of the stuff around it i was i think for me i was like am i qualified to tell the sk story there was like that yeah you know, imposter syndrome sure, like who, yeah. who am i to yeah. to tell that and but yeah, I decided that I would try, and I reached out to a couple of key people in the community. So Tim Sutton, who's a really important person in the SK community, and I reached out to Chris Martin, who is also a really important leader in that community, and said, "I've got this idea. Would you support me?" with the idea and they both eventually they both said yes they would and that they would they'd be happy to be involved and yeah so I just and then I started went seeking some filmmaker ex expertise because I yeah I wanted to make something I wanted to make something great and I knew that I couldn't do that by myself so that's when I reached out to you and about whether you had some recommendations of some people we could talk to, to collaborate with, to to make something. Yeah. So what was your, at that point, what was your, did you have a, a vision for the film at that point? A, 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 any kind of picture in your head about how it might look or was it something that kind of just grew, developed as you went along? So through the Muse storytelling course that I'd done, mm. There were some, there was a some really good frameworks, and some worksheets through that that I had. That was one of the first things I did, even before reaching out to the community. 
created I created like the why around why I wanted to make this film and mm. that was about inspiring people to go on adventures. Mm. So so I created that a I created a an a kind of a rough outline of some of the what I thought were the key kind of story points and yeah so I had an uh, so I, so I definitely had some ideas and yeah there were a lot of missing bits to how it was all going to work mm. and mm. the whole kind of storytelling piece evolved and was one of the biggest struggles mm. o- over the course of the project. Yeah, because at that point you didn't intend on putting yourself in the mo- in the film. No, it was you were going to be telling the story from other people's points of view. That's how I understood it when we, you first started to tell me about the idea, mm. which instantly fell in love with the idea of making this film, the concept that you had, because it just seems like such an inspiring story to put out to people and you've got that great landscape and all the dynamic dynamics that comes in with the Tarara range so Mm. it just had all the elements of a great film but you at that point it wasn't going you weren't going to be in it as a character or or even narrator I don't think no yeah yeah so your vision was to somehow I think using the interviews is that right tell the story through other people's yeah recollections yeah yeah Mm. so I had so I knew that I, I knew that I wanted to have a number of different interviews and I I was putting the word out trying to find different people who were interested in being involved. Tim and Chris were the first two that I asked for their involvement and then I went then I went looking for others and the yeah so I I was planning to build the story from those interviews and from some of the and from some of the other historic footage of some of the other characters like Colin Ralph and Chris Swallow. And really loosely speaking, it was grabbing the stories from those characters and then putting that to a a visual story of doing the SK. So that was my loose uh, concept. Yeah. But that didn't work. Yeah. (laughs) No, but it was a great starting point. That was the the launching point. But I do remember in one of those meetings where you you were telling me about the film, you wanted me to have a look at the footage you'd had, you'd collected over the last decade, Mm. which I was more than happy to do because I, I love looking through footage and seeing, just finding what cool stuff might be lingering in there. And so I went through most of your footage, all the GoPro footage, and yeah, it was just like, I think I was probably into my third card or third bit of footage because you'd had a, had a lot. I, it was probably, I think it must have been three or four hours worth of footage or something like that. Mm. It was obvious to me that you've, you've got enough footage here to tell a story. It's just a matter of who can we get on camera now to, to back up the footage and and make the story work. But yeah, I felt like the, the that footage was was going to be great. Mm. <laughs> it's just so much variety in it. And and it was yeah, very real. Mm. It wasn't filmed with a any it wasn't filmed with a making it a, 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 the final documentary in mind really. Mm. I guess it was just here I am doing this and this is what it's like. Mm. <laughs> so it was very gritty. Yeah. Yeah, I remember yeah. your reaction to it was yeah I was super excited because for a number of months I had been because I originally when I talked to you you thought that I should chat with Mike and I chatted with Mike a little bit and I was really I, I was I really wanted for whoever I was going to work with to see that footage mm. because I I thought there was a lot of kind of gold in there mm. and so. It it took a number of months until we got to the point where I wasn't going to work with Mike, and I think we what happened was is we, I, 
when you first told me you wanted to make this film, yeah. and I straight away thought, okay, we've got to get a camera operator in there, and we've got a cinematographer or whatever. We've got to get there and get some real proper documentary footage here. It's not yeah. all going to be GoPro footage. Sure, we'll use the GoPro footage, absolutely. But no, we're making documentary. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to get a, you guys got to get a cinematographer on board who's a bit of an adventurer too and can go in with a small kit, a smallish kind of camera kit, but actually get something that's... My my initial thought was, yeah, you need something that's going to to lift up the GoPro footage and that's going to bring it up to a, a more of a documentary standard. So how can we find someone who's willing to go in with you guys on your adventure? Because I guess what we haven't mentioned quite yet is that is that I might have this <laughs> around the wrong way, but you and Joe and Tim planned the adventure to go and capture f- the footage. And I think, but initially that adventure was going to be involved with that camera operator. Mm. And they were going to come in at, at different points, or maybe that they were going to do the bit at the beginning, then maybe they were going to come in halfway somewhere, and there were discussions about, or maybe even in the end as well, discussions about how that camera operator could could meet up with you guys, just so we'd have a, more of that kind of, a different kind of eye, a different sort of perspective to the story. So it wasn't all just that wide-angle GoPro footage. That was something that I pushed, I think, for, mm. but I didn't want to do myself. Yeah. <laughs> I think not long before you told me about the idea to make Tararua SK, I'd been on a overnight adventure with my son up to the name of the hut's just escaped me. It might be Turtify Hut? Yeah, Turtify, yeah. 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 And it was a slog in and out, and we didn't go up into the tops. It was along the valley floor, but it was just slogging through the mud for six hours each day. And I was pretty burnt by the end of that. And I thought, there's no way I can give Andy the kind of level of product, production value that I think it, this needs and do the, the you know, uh, walk in the ranges. I'm just not that. I'm not one of those kind of adventure type people. But So I, I cut myself out of that early on. I suggested some people that you could try and work with. And and around the same time, we were having discussions about, oh, we could set up a, a, a sort of an interview in one of the huts with people mm. and tell some old stories which I thought was quite, we thought was quite a good idea, didn't we? Mm. But I was thinking about this, thinking, oh, maybe it would have been harder to pull off than we thought with pe- <laughs> people coming to huts quite late in the day, they're tired, there's other noise and things going on. I don't know, it might have worked, but it's interesting to think about. But yeah, so you, so Mike became unavailable and then, so I suggested someone else you could work with f- for doing that and they had a conflict to time. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Also, we had it all booked in, so mm. we'd booked this window to go and do a film trip. So mm. when Tim was available for, I think it was about f- five or six days. Was there was a window where he was available, and the the cinematographer was available for I think four of those days, and then so we're hoping that both of those would line up. But unfortunately, they didn't line up, and the cinematographer photographer had another job, which was actually filming the New Zealand surf champs, which conflicted with that period of time that Tim was available that we got the weather window for. Yeah, so that meant that we had no cinematographer, and one of the key kind of elements that the cinematographer was bringing was a drone, so we could get some aerial photography which you know we thought would be really important so as this kind of unfolded I went and bought a drone and got a permit and learned how to fly the drone because the last time I'd owned a drone I managed to lose it on its first flight in the Tararua range <laughs> got blown off a ridge, never to be seen oh, again. No. <laughs> so, I how many drones are up there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and for the film trip, I invited a number of people from the community to be involved in that, and a few people showed some interest. and And Tim was it was awesome. Tim was able to be there, and and Joe was was really excited about getting there so it ended up being the three of us and we took on that trip we each had a gopro so we had three gopros we had the drone and we and i also had have a like a compact kind of travel video camera and so we had those five cameras for our film trip 
And so what did you do to prepare for that for that filming, becoming three cam- becoming three cin- cinematographers as well as completing the SK? Pretty lucky to have Joe and Tim there. Tim is an amazing photographer, has an incredible eye, has done quite a bit of GoPro work as well. So, you know... He's awesome, right? And Joe has had 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 his GoPro for a little while and had done a little bit of work, but again, very good eye. And so I created a shot list, and as we were driving up to the road end, I adjusted all the settings on all three GoPros so they're all the, so they're all the same because they're all different. And we discussed the the shot list and and we just chatted about a couple of different ideas about different angles and just some basic kind of shooting guidelines. Yeah, so that was we had this really quite cool conversation as we were driving to the road end in preparation for our film trip. Yeah. That was awesome. I think we're all good to go. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you, Tim, and Joe were filming with the GoPros on the... On the you were doing a two-day or a three-day or... Yeah, so we did a weekend. You did a weekend, SK? Yeah. Mm, yeah. So yeah. we... Yeah, we started on Friday afternoon and, yeah, went into the... Went into Dundas, which is... Yeah, I think it was... It might have been five or so hours for us to get into there. Yeah, so we got there just before dark into Dundas, yeah. And you got those, is that when you got those nice shots of the the, the drone shot coming, getting the sunset? So that yeah. we shot that, so that was the morning. Ah. And that was one of the shots that I was hoping to get was the sunrise at Dundas because Dundas is a, just a spectacular location and you've the hut faces out east. You've got that rising sun. Mm, mm. And we had this weather forecast that looked really good. And as we started on Friday afternoon, it was it was great. But once we got actually onto the range proper, there was clag and it was a bit it was a bit kind of murky. So we got to Dundas and I was really hoping that it would clear for the morning so we could get some of those shots of the sunrise from mm. Dundas and it, and it did and it was beautiful. Yeah. And it was yeah, it was an amazing it was an amazing trip at Dundas. We arrived and the the hut was already a, you know, I think there was one couple who were bunked up on one bunk, so there was one bunk spare. Joe and Tim got to that you know, they they top and tailed on a bunk and I found a I found a little one someone else had a little squab mattress that I could set up on the floor, and we had a couple of other people come in after us. It was a full right. It was a full <laughs> hut. Yeah, and and one of the people that arrived th- that night was Megan Setti, mm. who was doing a weekend SK as well. Mm. And Megan is the was the editor of the SK book. Yeah, it's just like. <laughs> Yeah. Classic. It's great. You know, it's so great. Yeah. And we were chatting with Megan and, and had a wonderful few days together along yeah. along the route. So Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and so yeah. I wanted to just talk about the yeah, just the, the obviously taking GoPros into the ranges was the way to go because you guys could do your walk without losing any ground. And still capture a range of different types of shots, ranging from a real low angle to the ground to stationary shots to uh, moving shots to just vistas and details. You know, bringing the cameras up close to details as you were going, and mm. which you've done a lot in the um, archival footage too. You, mm. There was a lot of like nice detail shots, and um, the GoPro's got a wee microphone on it, so it captures the the natural environment. It, often it gets a bit, a bit of wind noise going in it, which just add for me, added to the authenticity of the environment yeah. uh, rather than, but yeah, you did a, yeah, you did an amazing job in using a lot of that sound in the, 
in in the final edit and bringing those special effects or those sound effects through, which really added a whole another dimension to to the film which mm. yeah was really cool it was a real treat to be able to, to have all that there to use yeah one of the ones that sticks out is the sound of people's feet going through the icy grass the, the icy tussock yeah that had to go on the film yeah <laughs> and i had no idea where it would fit things like that had to go on the, in there because it just gives you a sense of the environment yeah. and, and the fact that people do it at different times of year like it's mm. not just a summer adventure it's it does get it taken on all year round it seems yeah, yeah but yeah, so you guys and, and Tim did vlogs. Yeah, little, which I think we, we, did. Did he tell you he was doing those? We talked about. Yeah, we talked about doing right. those. One of the part of the conversation we had in the car was mm. going, "Look, if you've got things you want to say, it's great, great to share those. Mm. They can be really." That can be really great footage and really great sound bites mm. for the film. We did talk about that, and and you know, t- amazing at that. He's a really, yeah, really powerful communicator, and yeah, it was amazing because you you uncovered some some wonderful some wonderful snips of that quite late in the edit. I I found a couple. I'd included a couple of my rough, my first rough edit, but yeah, there were some great ones that you uncovered that actually, I remember we actually replaced some of the interview sound bites with, with, there was at least one of vlogs that was a far better, a far better clip than what we got in the interview. It's, a, it's just amazing what he he did. It yeah. was a total surprise. I did. I don't think either either of us were expecting that. You'd had the discussion about doing the yeah. doing it, but he'd really gone all out. And, yeah, and 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 taken the time as he was walking to tell these little stories and share memories, and and, mm. and also giving a sense of his feelings in the moment of doing the walk as well. Mm. And yeah, when I stumbled across it, because stumbling across it because there was just a lot of footage plus. I guess we'll get to talk about it too. We were up a bit of a deadline at one point too. So <laughs> it was like, oh my God. And I think it was just a coming across you know, him, him, part of his vlog and just, oh, what, what, what have we got here? Oh my God, the first bit I listened to was, well, let's use that. Mm. Oh, okay. There's just so much here we could have pulled from to use. So that was a real find. Yeah, it was great. That, But all in all, what you guys did around getting into the filming with the GoPros and the Rangers and your drone work, that that was a humongous, that's what the film needed. So you, cause, so at this point, you've got the, you've got all your interviews, which you did mostly late 2022, early 2023. Mm. You did a head around six interviews, maybe something like that. Yep. You have, you've got the archival footage from the SK Awards evenings. And then you've got the, and then you've got all the old GoPro footage, and then you've got your new adventure you've been. So by this point, February or whatever it was, mm. you've got all the elements that need to go into the film. I don't think what we really talked so much at the moment about is the interviews that you did with mm. Dave and Gary, and all the names, of course, are just going to escape my mind at this moment. Yeah. But that was a new thing for you to, to sit down and interview people, and that was part yeah. of the process of making this film, as you learning how to interview and. Get the, and because the interviews you, you did were people spoke very sincerely and, and they really helped to tell the story. Yeah, so I had experimented one, maybe once or twice just since doing some of the courses on doing some interviews. But yeah, this was the first time I'd done the proper interviews and and it was amazing having having you there to film and do the sound properly but yeah the, the interviews were a real highlight of the process sitting down and chatting with people about stuff that they love is it's so cool and you get to have conversations with people that you wouldn't have otherwise yeah it was amazing to i mean our first interview session we had we had chris tim and and olivia and yeah like that doing that really created a whole lot of momentum for for the film and then finding finding Dave Kappa who was you know him and Bruce Jeffries were the first to successfully complete the weekend challenge and 
and Dave was was open to being involved and being interviewed, which was a real it was was just really important for the film. I've had lots of feedback that Dave Kappa's interview is just one of the one of the real highlights of the film. And you and I went over to his house in in Carterton and had an amazing couple of hours there. It was a really special. And then and Sir Graham Dingle. And I like I was a bit scared really of asking Graham whether he would whether he'd want to be involved or not. And but yeah, eventually I got a bit of encouragement from a few people to reach out to him and, and that was amazing. It was great to get his perspective. And then interviewing Jean Jean Beaumont. Jean was just you know, was amazing. Mm, that yeah, was yeah. she was Yeah. That was really very special. Gary Goldsworthy, he had some great some great nuggets to share. And it was really fun doing the interview with Tim, Joe and I after we'd done the film trip. Because the film trip was it was a, a really it's a really amazing thing to share with to share with others. That was the first time that I'd done a trip with Tim and first time I'd done a, a trip with Joe and and I've done one subsequent trip with with Joe and yeah it's just it's a it's very special to go and share an adventure like that and with the film trip we were trying to capture something we were trying to make something about something that we all love it was yeah it was a very nice experience it was fantastic because it really added to the you you were creating the story as you were going along for this documentary, <laughs> which was fantastic because it was it was beautiful but beautiful to show that actual adventure mm. going on in the background, or lead, leading the story. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, uh, what? Yeah. So what point did you? So there was a you had the opportunity to send this to submit this film for the Mountain Film Festival. Yeah, yeah. And was that something that you always were planning to do? From the beginning, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the adventure film school I mm. went to as part of the New Zealand Mountain Film Festival. Mm. Yeah, my my goal was to make a film to submit to the the Mountain Film Festival, and the deadline for that was, I think it was the twentieth of April. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and so I was. Yes, yeah, so I was. I was. I was working towards that, and everything was going okay, until I started putting together my f- first edit, and I had these amazing sound bites from the interviews, and we had some amazing footage. But yeah, my original kind of idea of how the story would be told just just didn't work. So yeah, what was that first edit? What just what was it? So you'd put together. It, it was your first. It was your first narrative. It was your first go at making the film. Yeah. So you know, it's it's just a matter of getting something made, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So it was. Yeah. It was about getting something, getting a foundation mm. to to work from. Mm. And one of the things that I got taught at the adventure film school, and I I know. You reminded me of it, and, and I've had other reminders about it as well. Was the first thing you've got to do is you've got to finalise your story. You've got to finalise that that audio of your story before you start putting pictures to it. And I didn't really follow that strictly for my first, for my first edit. It was a mistake, but it's one of those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the films you'd been making prior to that were basically like your trips of your adventures. We you you'd edited it together highlights package of your yeah. you know, of a particular adventure somewhere around New Zealand and you'd you know live action narrated over it yeah and I think when you uh, having watched a few of those I felt like yeah okay we've got something here because you're you know the way you tell stories and your voice works quite well over the footage so there's something going on there 
So let, let's work on that. But um, so you, you talk. I think you did. You take initially. That's the sort of pro- approach you, you were taking. Did you have a narration at that point? No, I can't remember. Yeah. No, I don't think no. I. I don't think I had. No, because my plan was to use the interviews of Joe, Tim, and I mm. to to connect things together, but but that that didn't work and. Yes, yeah, so I got a bit lost at that point. I didn't really know where to go, and you provide you're provi- providing some great input and some great guidance around cutting down the interviews, getting them themed into into different story parts, and I'd I'd wanted to go and talk to a friend of mine, Mark Elveston, who's a very, very successful filmmaker, but again, I was a bit, I was a bit kind of shy of going and asking him for help, and yeah, and also a little embarrassed about what I created so far. Yeah, I just thought he would think it was just rubbish. So yeah, I finally plucked up the courage to go and have a conversation with him, and he was, and he was amazing. So it was great to, he was like, okay, with a documentary like this, you absolutely have to have one narrator. You've got to have a consistent spine across this to have it work. And and there was a lot of other great input he gave me what was around like just really focusing on the story focusing on like the really interesting kind of dramatic things and the different angles you could take. Yeah, it was his input that kind of drove a lot of my narration ideas from there. Things like the comparison about the the vertical climb being twice the same vertical climb as climbing Mount Everest twice from base camp. That was his his kind of input going, create comparisons, create some interest and in some things that people can cap, connect to. And in the same kind of vein that the SK burns calories, 15,000 of them, that's the same as 150 gels or 40 Big Macs. It was mm. kind of come thinking about those things and finding finding the little mm. stories, some of the little stories around the food about Danny Garrett consuming 40 gels and mm. getting the runs a couple of days later mm. and mm. and Sam leaving his famous wraps in the car and doing his SK mm. just on a few Mars bars and some gels. Mm. That input was super useful and what well, was amazing. And so that got me re-energised because mm. I felt like... I didn't know where to go. Mm. And then when I started working on that narration and working with you coaching me around that and with you coaching me on just how to work with the sound bites from the interviews to really trim them right back to what are the necessary words here in the sound bite. It doesn't matter if we move, if we snip out a whole bunch of these words that don't need to be there. And Mark was the same. He was like, when you're pulling together those sound bites, people don't necessarily speak the way that you want to have it come out. Edit it. Take a word from here Mm. and put it where it needs to be. Mm. You're telling the story. You Mm. tell the story with the things that you've got. You don't have to use the whole sentence. No, no. You're still communicating the message in the story. Yeah. You're just making it easy for people to digest and, and propel the story forward. Yeah. 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 Mm. And and so that was a real that was a real eye opener. Mm. And it's incredible. I think going through and doing that and a lot of the coaching you gave me around that really helped me refine the narration to what are the words, like the smallest number of words that I can use to communicate the key thing here. And you talk to me a lot about finding that 
those the, that rhythm and cr- being able to cr- have the narration create the connection mm. to the next piece of the story. Yeah, you know, so I, I spent hours doing that, and, and a lot of time I spent hours thinking about that and working on that while I was running or riding mm. or mm. out on adventures, mm. just running through it over and over again and going, okay, how could I refine this even more? Mm. Yeah, it was so important to be able to put yourself into the story and and use your narration as a way, as a glue, to bring everything, you, all the components you've already got, you've got the story there, it had to, there had to be a way for the to make it relatable for an audience. Yeah. And, and I think that's, yeah, when you, it was pretty obvious <laughs> just with your passion for the adventure and your knowledge of the adventure and everything that that you knew about it that you yeah that that we realized that you had to be a character in the film mm. and that you were able to take people the audience on the adventure and make it relatable for the audience yeah which is so important yeah it was so great that you you did that and uh, which I don't think was easy for you to do no it wasn't it, it wasn't easy it felt very self-conscious mm. uh, and it felt very very uncomfortable but i would say especially because you'd gone through the two failures mm. and then completing and then getting the triumph of completing one so i mean it was yeah as uncomfortable as it was you had to be in it <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It, you know it, yeah. it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the story it is without that so yeah. So yeah. So that's so you. So where are we? We're in the yeah. So I guess so we've so now we've got this deadline yeah. of the Mountain Film Festival deadline looming, mm. and after I've worked on this narration, and I then so I worked on the audio and I got my audio edit done. To a point that I was happy that it had a good, strong story. So I then created a. So it was a. It was about that point that an email came out from the Mountain Film Festival. I was working on that final kind of narration. Well, as I was working on that, they sent out an email saying, "If you're working, if you're working hard on something." we can potentially provide you an extended deadline for the finished copy. And so I I saw that and I was like, okay, wow, this could be a lifesaver to actually um, being able to submit something into the festival. And and so I yeah, asked the question, could we could I get an extension on the deadline? And uh, Mark uh, from the festival said, yep, you can do that. We just need you to submit a rough cut by by late April and you can have until the end of May to finish it off. And so I worked on the I worked on the rough cut and so that was pretty much my narration and the audio done and then I put some of the amazing footage we had to that and submitted the rough cut. Now, and at that point, I then reached out to, and we were chatting all the time, but I asked if you had some availability to to put some, some good hours into it to really bring it up to a whole new level. And yeah, luckily for me, you had a gap, and you and lucky for me too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that I got to do it. Yeah, and yeah, you s- started working away. How was that for you? Yeah, that was amazing. I think it was, so. It was late April that you must have asked, and it, and it had to be in by the thirtieth of May. Yeah. So we had about five, four, four or five weeks. Um, and yeah, it was yeah, I was totally up for the challenge of it, and because I'd seen the footage and I'd been involved in filming interviews with you so I felt like I had a really great understanding of the story and we'd been working together 
chatting throughout the year up to this point anyway about the film so it was an absolute no-brainer to say yes and do that but wow that deadline okay it wasn't we had four or five weeks to just edit and edit and edit we had to really have it ready within two or three weeks by mid-April so we could by mid-May mm. so we could do the post other post-production like color grading or sound mixing and or just make sure that we've got a, a bit of extra time at the end to make changes or whatever ever we need to do so really we you and I worked on a plan to work back from that date and have some key dates in that we'd, we'd try and target so but yeah that was probably one of the more yeah definitely one of the more intense I, I've made a sort of a couple of shorter documentaries before but they didn't have any deadlines on them so to have that deadline for this was um, really forced us to get through forced forced me forced me to get through those kind of I, I st- so you had your edit as it was which is mm-hmm. the one that got into the film so the narrative was really strong the pr- story was pretty much there what we needed to do next was basically make it work in a s- more of a cinematic way i guess you could say so mm. we need a sort of a, a strong beginning we needed a strong ending and then we needed a way of taking your narration and the footage and the interviews and making it all work in kind of a we in kind of a way that you could feel pulled along on the story it would work technically yeah so basically yeah you had all the elements there and I just had to go through and just start at the beginning and just um, not look at the task ahead. <laughs> just focus on this one minute section here, this one minute section here. And I just kept, I, I basically, what the first thing I did when you asked me to edit it was, I think you had all the interviews cut down already. Um, mm-hmm. But what I did is I went through all of that GoPro footage that you'd shown me the previous year. And I went through all of that and I basically was... I didn't want to leave a single stone unturned. <laughs> I wanted to see everything in the way that I edit, and I suppose is what, what people do, but I want I, just to go through everything and just find everything and find all the, pick all the good shots out. So I went through every single clip, made cut downs of every clip and every adventure that you'd been on and and just made sure that I knew what was there to use because I knew that at some point I was, I was going to need to, maybe call on this type of shot or this type of shot to express this bit of narration or express this part of the interview. I did that and I also did that with the January trip footage as well. I just methodically went through, did the same thing with that. And that's when we stumbled across, yeah, Tim's vlogs mm. and his stuff. And and I suggested to you, I pulled a few things out that Tim had said and I said, look, I think this bit here will go really well on the edit. Mm. So I would just throw them in the edit. We'd we had a, a shareable project so we could see what was going on at the same time. And so, yeah, it was great to be able to work together in a relatively fast way. And I could say to you, hey, look, I've got up to the, I've got up to five minutes. Have a look at the first five minutes and see mm. what you think. And, and then again at the 10 or 15 marks or whatever it was. But, but yeah, yeah, so finding those things from Tim really helped the story. And, but just going through everything and just organising it in the fashion that I organising it, organised it in. And then just building the story minute by minute and taking what taking your sound bites and and then making them work in a I guess what I but what I was able to do in this process was start starting to find a kind of a, a pace for the film, mm. a rhythm for the film. And I started off with a we decided to start with a, a sound bite from Tim to open it. Now mm. I don't remember whether you had that in already. Him he said how you describe the the SK in one word, I think it was the yeah. So in my yeah, so in my rough cut, no, it didn't start with that. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was how can we hook people into the story? And so that first minute was about just hooking people in, mm. and and I made that bit of that montage, which actually evolved. We did a bit of I did a bit of a recut of mm. of that down the track, but just because of that tight deadline we had, it wasn't we didn't have much time to to look back. <laughs> you get a minute together and then you get on to the next minute. It wasn't so much going and looking back and, oh, how can we make that minute better? Mm. It's like, okay, that'll do for now. Yeah, so this process was really just, yeah, finding a pace, finding a natural rhythm. Okay, we're coming out of the soundbite into that bit of narration. We'll leave a gap here for some music. And then and then I think I, as I was going, I was adding B-roll as I was going as well. So I was going through and getting to, getting, to, getting a f- few minutes into the, Audio edit, and then okay, now pulling from my cut downs and really thinking about the shots that are going to work here and playing around a little bit and experimenting with the shots that might work. Mm. But yeah, so just building a road, 
and but not looking back basically just there's a minute there's a minute and mm. keeping that deadline in mind and that was fundamental having that deadline because if there hadn't been a deadline I think the process of making it would have been a lot more drawn out mm. and I wouldn't have been as taken my time a little bit more to, to to make it but I think being under that pressure to really make it work in a short time frame I think made it what it was and yeah so we yeah, yeah. so yeah I think we were, I think you were probably 10 days into that process when I got the news that based on the rough cut, the film had been selected for the festival. Yeah, that's right. And I didn't realise that they were going to make the selection based on the rough cut. I thought they were going to wait until they got the final version Mm. before they chose whether to select it or not. I was surprised, Mm. super excited. They'd selected it based on the rough cut, which was really based on the, yeah, I guess the story and the fact that we had some beautiful shots in there. But the difference between the rough cut and the the and the beautiful, the beautiful film that that you created in the end was, you know, substantial and. I mean, like a massive step up. And then we got the, do you remember, we had the, so we submitted the final oh, cut. yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then I got an email because my rough cut was 19 minutes. Right. And I think your final edit was 28 minutes, 29 minutes. And so the festival came back and said, look, I'm really sorry, we've done all the programming and scheduling based on 19 minutes. We need you to cut 10 minutes out of your final edit. Mm. After you've spent five (laughs) weeks labouring over every single, just making it beautiful, and and, and they said, and we need it within three days. (laughs) <laughs> that was the final version and within three days, wasn't it? Yeah. So that was we'd, at that point we'd, yeah. So I'd made I'd made the edit twenty nine minute edit. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna send this into the festival. Fantastic. Um, it's been accepted. That's even more amazing. Yeah. And then sorry guys, you got to chop out ten minutes. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> that was a real yeah. It was a real hat head and hands moment for me. It was yeah. like you got to be good joking. Yeah. You know? But what could we do? That was what we had to do. I think I think you took the you were able to be a lot more brutal than I was at that point, mm. and uh, you chopped out the bits that you felt we could get rid of mm. based on some. I think they gave a bit of advice themselves as well, mm. and so we ended up with a a nineteen twenty minute first oh, one. Okay, yeah, yeah. They let, they gave us a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't watched that version again since then, but I think we cut, we had a version that worked. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, which is interesting, and I think yeah. So. But it was, look, it was gutting to have to do that. But I wonder if it played an important part in the final edit because we made some important editorial choices as well at that point mm. with some things we wanted to chop out that I think remained out from memory. Because the final edit is 26 minutes, including credits. So Yeah. Yeah, the, the, yeah most of that is is actually around the credits. So, mm. you know, there were a few things there. So... You know, like the, um, so in the final edit kind of pre-credits, I think, you know, we've, it, it's pretty much the same as your final edit. Oh, right. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, sure. the couple of little tweaks here and there yeah. that we made, but, um, yeah, so that was, um, so we overcame that, uh, challenge and we then had, yeah, so the Mountain Film Festival, Yeah, you know, I went to Wanaka and with, with my family and, yeah, that was amazing. 420 people in a packed theatre, massive screen, and yeah, or I got to do a little intro to the film, and yeah, such an exciting time to sit there in the, for the first time, to sit there in a, I had a couple of screenings with some family and friends just to to get some feedback and to get some final kind of tweaks, but to sit there in an audience and have them react was yeah amazing. And then a few days later, we had the Wellington screening at the Penthouse, and 
Yeah. How, how was that night for you? Ah, yeah, that was incredible to be able to, yeah, to be able to, to sit in the cinema uh, and watch a film that you've um, played a part in making is, is always a real privilege. And to see it on the big screen, going off the small screen, <laughs> the little office with the little computer monitor to seeing it actually how it's supposed to be seen in that environment was with the audience and getting a feel of how the audience was enjoying it was really special mm. and such a great feeling after all that we'd been through to get to that point yeah it was really yeah it was fantastic mm. <laughs> yeah yeah you had Caspi in there and yeah and to be able to yeah to have my son along to, to view it as well and it, it, he'd had to put up with me <laughs> with my long hours editing at home and he'd come in and have a look at bits of it as well and yeah so that was a lovely thing to be able to share and that was the begin, beginning of yeah many screenings that you were able to pull off too but the, yeah and that event was a fundraiser for the Graham Dingle Foundation too which I yeah. think you managed to raise about two, 2004 yeah 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 so mm. that was it was really nice the penthouse when I spoke to you know, when I spoke to them and about whether we could hire a theatre or and do a screening. And he was like, how long's the short film? And I'm like, it's 20, I think at that stage, that version was 29 minutes, the, the full version that we had. And he said, okay, one of the things, I can provide you the theatre for free. Because of because it's a short film, we can fit it in between our standard screenings. And the thing that we just ask is if you can encourage people to use the bar and restaurant, and then that would be great. And so I, I when when they came back with that, I was like, okay, yeah, let's do it as a fundraiser. It'd be good to do that. And Sir Sir Graham Dingle had had kindly made himself available to be interviewed and was in in the film and. It has an incredible foundation that's focused on using the outdoors to help young people. It just seemed like a great idea. And yeah, it was a really special night to have so many people from the SK community there and to have friends and family there to share that with. It was, yeah, it's cool. And um, you started to get a bit of feedback. How was the feedback from the Ma- the Mountain F- Film Festival? How was the feedback from the screening in Wellington? You started to get a sense that it was something that was resonating with people. Yeah, yeah. the The feedback from the Mountain Film Festival was was fantastic. People people loved it. There were lots of people asked what SK stands for. Yeah, that was. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I made a film about the Tararua SK and haven't really explained what SK stands for. So that was, so I know we made a couple of little tweaks to make that a little clearer. And yeah, we got some great feedback from the Wellington event. And I'd created a little, a little IMDB listing for the film. And we started to get a couple of, a couple of reviews with with some really nice feedback for the the adventure community, it was definitely connecting and inspiring them. Mm. And there were lots of people who were who knew a lot about the SK who were like, "Wow, it's cool, really cool to see that brought to life and just the beauty of it." And there were also a lot of people who, well, there were people who were on the fringe who were finding out more about about the SK and and definitely had feedback from people that watched the film and have gone and done SKs and and I was doing a trip doing a tramping trip with my daughter and a friend and we were staying at one of the huts along the route and there was a, a couple that had seen the film and they were doing an SK partly inspired from watching the film, so it was, yeah, it was having the the impact that um, that we hoped that it would. So, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, and so it, it was obvious that it was starting to resonate with the people in the community. And then I guess the next challenge was, can this be appreciated by a wider audience? Mm. So that was really when you began the the other half of documentary filmmaking, which is content is king. 
as they say, and uh, distribution is a queen. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to use if if you were to use those sort of terms. So this began your next adventure, really, which was getting it seen beyond the community mm. and also further into the community too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really thought much about this prior to making the film, and I'd never made one before, so didn't know anything about distribution. I thought, well, I thought that, I mean, I knew about film festivals, and I thought, you know, I'd submit it to some film festivals, and we'd done that for, you know, the New Zealand Mountain Film Festival, and got in, and I thought would that somehow you'd submit it to festivals and that people would get to see it and that distributors would pay attention to film festivals and that would open up some opportunities. So after the New Zealand Mountain Film Festival, the the New Zealand Mountain Film Festival has this national tour, but, but my film wasn't on the national tour. So the first thing I did was I contacted some of the organisations that were screening the national tour to see if they were interested in adding my film on as an extra. And a number of them did, so it's screened it's screened in Wellington at the National Tour. It's screened up in Whanganui, um, Palmerston North, Waikanae. So that was great. I had I got approached to ask if, if it could be screened at a big trail running event that was happening down in Arrow Arrowtown, and and there were a couple of other kind of screenings, and then. I thought, okay, I should submit it to some other film festivals. And the I knew about some of the big mountain film festivals around the world. I knew about Banff, which is, as far as I know, it's one of the largest and best in the world. And then there's there's a big there's a big one in, in America called Mountain Film, and there's a, a a big one in the UK as well. And so I submitted to quite a few festivals and I knew that with Banff if you got selected that you could possibly also get selected for their world tour and that would mean that it would go on this world road show that and in, in, you know went to many countries around the world including New Zealand and that's like the absolute mecca so I I, I applied to I sub I signed up to the the film festival platform and submitted my film to to a bunch of different festivals and, and selected for for a couple which was really exciting and again I hoped that would mean that people got to see it and that you know there might be some further distribution but but that didn't happen and and the film didn't get selected for Banff and didn't get selected for the big UK and big US festivals, which was, yeah, that was disappointing. I submitted to lots of festivals and got lots of non-selections. We did get a few, a, a couple of selections, which was which was exciting. One of them turned out to be just a scam. So that was a yeah. bit of, that was a, of a bit of a learning curve mm. so the it turns out that the tokyo short film festival is actually just some people in italy running a bit of an online film festival scam and so <laughs> yeah that was a bit disappointing but we did get selected for a for the toronto documentary and feature film festival which is not to be confused with the the huge Toronto International Film Festival which is very prestigious but but and we won an award which was really which was amazing film won best human interest film at at that festival which which was super exciting and felt it was really nice that somebody from outside of New Zealand had appreciated what we created and the film got selected for a a film festival in Slovakia and be became a finalist 
and also won a won an excellence award at at another festival, but still no yeah. no distribution. So yeah. I yeah. So I went in. So I signed up to do a course. I thought I have to learn film distribution. <laughs> so I did so this from one course to another. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'd done filmmaking and now I was doing mm. this film distribution course. So I did that. I found this I also found this uh, amazing book on film distribution, which is called Beyond the Box Office. And it's all about distributing independent films. And yeah, so from there I st- I'd already set up the film so people could rent or buy it on the website that I created, sk.com, so that people who'd missed the screenings could could see the film. And I had a few people who had taken up that opportunity, which was great. And then through doing the course and reading the book, I started doing a little bit more started doing a little bit of marketing of the film, a little bit of digital advertising. I started reaching out to some different distribution companies to see if they were interested and just finding out what the avenues uh, were. And a few things that I found was, one was that for a lot of short independent films there's a lot of self-distribution that goes on and sometimes people put together little film tours they are selling direct they're using other platforms to get their get their films distributed so i so one of the early kind of ideas that i was that i had was in new zealand i knew i'd watch some adventure documentaries on in new zealand and so I thought it could be good content for them. So I reached out to them and got no reply. I followed up and they came back and said, media team will come back to you if there's any interest. And I heard nothing. So I, I have a friend who used to be a, an executive at in New Zealand. So I asked if he would mind finding out who who kind of the person is to talk to. And he wasn't able to he wasn't able to find out. So then many months later I was I was on a surf trip with a couple of friends and I showed them the film and we were talking about other ways we could distribute it. And and one of my friends who lives in Auckland said, Oh, one of my friends from down the road is an analyst in New Zealand. I could connect you. He might have a contact. And so through him, I found out the name of the content agency that that they use for their films, for their in-flight entertainment. And so once I had that organization's name, I sent them a message and said, hey, I've got this film. I think that will make great content. And, and they came back to me and said, Oh yeah, we're putting together some a content plan at the moment for the next kind of slot of four months. We'll check it out, and and eventually they came back and said, "Yep, we like it. We'll put it forward to New Zealand and see with the next batch of entertainment." And yeah, it was super exciting that they came back and said, "Yep, we'll we can get it on there." There was first there was like, so how much do you want? for the licensing fee and and so I was able to find out through a friend who had licensed a, a short film before that they don't like to pay very much to license a short film but we but amazing to to have it on in New Zealand. So Yeah, that's yeah. really awesome. Yeah. yeah. So did you envision you would uh, did you envision that from the beginning when you started making the film that you'd no. be able to that's have just re- seen in that way. That's pretty cool. Yeah, to be honest. Oh, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Amazing that that people outside of the direct kind of community will get a chance to see the film. And I've we've both had messages from people that wouldn't watch the film otherwise. And so that's been super cool. Yeah. Getting the occasional 
message for the picture of the screen yeah the, the back of the seat with the film poster that's pretty yeah. cool <laughs> yeah and, um yeah and you didn't you haven't stopped you didn't stop there no you kept at it <laughs> yeah i kept at it yeah. so thank you <laughs> <laughs> so i one of the things that i learned about in my course was just getting it on some of the other platforms amazon prime video so that was so that's something that I was able to get the film onto. So that's available in the UK and the US for those audiences. And that was something I could manage myself. And then Apple TV. So I found how, a way that I could get it onto Apple TV. And then I came, I learned about a independent film distribution, what they call an aggregator distributor. So there's a business called uh, Film Hub and you can license your film to them and they have, they work with about 130 different channels from all around the world on different platforms to license and distribute films. The film is on there and it's been licensed to a couple of different channels in the US there is a um, lots of people have these boxes that are kind of like a sky box and uh, the film screening on one of the channels uh, through that and there's a, a few others as well so yeah and we've together a few press releases and really it was really nice of the local media to pick that up and put together some and to just put together some great articles that appeared in the the paper and online and also Kyoto magazine through that a few more people have got to to rent and see the so. film so yeah it's yeah it's cool that yeah. uh, it's got out there yeah. and I that... think it's an amazing outcome in winning the awards and also the, I never thought when I was editing it that it was going to be beyond the I never really thought that far ahead I thought oh this is going to be in the film festival fantastic that's great mm. I never thought it was going to be on streaming services and I'm on in New Zealand and what you've been able to pull off with it so it's great that it's actually out there and hopefully people you know, lots of different people, not just in the in that community. Other people, everyone can enjoy the film, and yeah, that's an amazing that you've been able to. Are you to pull all that off? Are you still hustling? Are you still looking for avenues to promote the film? Yeah, I'm still hustling. Yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be doing it for the next ten years. We, we, we might have to do like the expanded ninety minute feature edition of the film, or something. <laughs> do a re, a re, revisit it in like a an updated uh, twenty thirty version or something. Yeah. <laughs> Made it off. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, it's been a pretty amazing last couple of years working together on this project. What's uh, what's one of the the best moments that, from your perspective, that we shared over that time? Yeah, look for me, I, I think the collaboration has been really the the key thing. It's been the the really amazing thing that's come out of it, like the realization that um, finding. It's, Working together with somebody with a shared vision, and but working together in a collaborative way where you're pushing each other a little bit and you're um, challenging each other a little bit too, asking questions and um, you know proposing ideas and the push and pull of that, and and just the kind of the that has what has been a real highlight for me is that you, doing things on your own is fine, but when you when you join forces with somebody to create something, it, you can create something really amazing, and it can be a really amazing experience. And a lot of the work I do for my work is on my own, and I ha am starting to work with people a lot more now, which is fantastic. And when you find, you know, when you find other people that can understand your vision, and I felt like I really understood your vision, it, to be able to just lend my skills into your vision was probably my highlight, <laughs> really. Yeah, I think just w something amazing that can happen when you just you, you bring other people, you bring people together to work on something. And I think as far as specific moments go, probably hearing it getting accepted and 
to the, the, the film festival that you intended to get into, and then everything else that sort of come from that, really. But yeah, just the fact that you were happy with the edit that I made, that, I'd, that was all I needed. That was my, that was very, that was a great moment, just the fact that you were happy with what I was doing. So, yeah. Cool. <laughs> so, dream projects, if you could make a documentary on any topic or adventure anywhere in the world, what would it be and why? I don't know if I can answer that question. Okay, next question. <laughs> I'm just trying to think. No, nothing jumps to mind. <laughs> yeah. So your, a, your go-to activity to relax after filmmaking and dealing with all of the challenges, you have entered the world of stand-up comedy. <laughs> and yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, a, gr- a great way of getting out of my filmmaking world, which can get quite serious, is to just do comedy. And I started doing sketch comedy during the COVID lockdowns at home because I realised I had a captive audience <laughs> for all my <laughs> stupid ideas, so why not? And that went really well. And and yeah, since then, I I guess when you said before, what are my long-term, what are my goals or what, what would I like to do? I actually would like to produce, I love filmmaking and I love documentary making and, I, and I'm planning to make more documentaries and I'm currently making a documentary about a another street photographer a photographer at the moment which is part of a series I've been I started four or five years ago and that's a going on a bit of a tangent here now but that's a documentary that's going to be taking at least a year to make so I'm just checking in with this photographer as she's creating her one of her photo books um but um, but I'm also I'd like to create a sketch comedy series I've taken a bit of a dev- deviation from that at the moment I'm trying stand out uh, stand up comedy which is a terrifying thing to do but yeah these things that are a great way of relaxing and a great way of taking my mind off the my job, if, as it were, and just having fun. Yeah. And so that's probably what I do, really, as I, I really love comedy and uh, testing the waters and experimenting there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just thinking about favourite moment moments, what's your favourite moment in Tararua SK that gives you a smile or a sense of pride every time you watch it? Oh gee, that is a tough question. Some things that during the during making, you know, editing this that just fell together, and that's, you know, due in part to just the strong narrative that was there already. But yeah, I guess one that jumps to mind just right at this moment is the you the the three of you were filming your yourselves completing the trail coming out of the car park, and so I was able to intercut as you guys were coming to the end. So I was jumping from one camera to the next. And then Tim submitted a song, and you didn't know what we could do with the song. And I decided, well, why not just put it over the over that part? And that mm-hmm. seemed to work quite well. And then you guys hugging and embracing at the end. Yeah, I, I felt like we had a good ending to the film, and I, so I was quite pleased with that. Any other sort of moments that jump out? Yeah, probably. I just like the humour that you added into it, actually. Yeah, I like the around the the canola royal and the hut and the stories about the some of the, the trips. I think yeah, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, do you? What advice would you give to an aspiring filmmaker? Yeah, probably definitely getting people on board early on who share your vision, so you're not out there on your own, and having a really thorough pre production process really researching if it's in documentary researching really understanding the people who you're going to be interviewing understanding the story and also with documentary just being really open to how the process will evolve along the way and making discoveries so I having a plan but not sticking to it so much that you're not you're going to miss opportunities that come up along the way for example finding that footage from Tim just being prepared for uncovering things and yeah and just having a having a good solid plan about how you want to how you want something to be filmed and approaching it but also as you've done to work and getting advice from experienced people in the industry like Mark and and just taking on advice that advice and getting yeah I think it's a it's definitely like a team effort yeah but probably the most important thing too is also you had a really strong story, so having a strong story to tell is really important because that's what shone through from the beginning to the end, was having the strong story. So that was there well before I even touched it. And also having yeah, having the strong story and something else that just escaped my mind, sorry. Yep. <laughs> I have to chop this bit out. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> say, that's cool. Oh, there's something else I was going to say there. 
That'll come to me when I'm in the car driving home. Yeah. Cool. So I think that's... They were just a couple of things I wanted to cover. And so I was going to ask you, yeah, what would you do different now that you've come to the the end of the filmmaking process and you're still in the di- distribution process? Is there anything different you would have done in hindsight with the pre-production, with the planning? or? Yep, yep. There's a whole lot of things I would have done really differently. Yeah. One of the key things I would do differently is... I would find, I'd find some funding for the film, some way to be able to make it financially work because it's been an amazing, an amazing experience, but it's also cost a reasonable amount of money, which is not really long-term sustainable to, to do that. So I would do that. This huge amount of, a huge number of lessons that I've learned around, you know, the storytelling process and how to approach that. So I would, so that would be, yeah. So I, I, I now have a little bit more of a formula around that. So that would, um, you know, really change, make that process work a whole lot better. Yeah, I, I think I'd have a I have a much clearer kind of picture about what the what kind of success looks like at the end and work back to it from there. So yeah, that would be some of the things I'd do differently. And what's a highlight for you of the film? So the highlight for me is when you're in an audience watching the film, listening to them re- react to it. There's a I love a lot of I love all of the interview with Dave Kappa. There's a line that Gene delivers in the film around kind of leading into the weather section that just sends shivers up my spine every time I watch it. And when she says that they even though the forecast was bad, they yeah. went and did it anyway and she says, I'd never do that never again. Never do that again. Yeah. yeah that yeah. just Sends a shiver up my spine every time. Yeah, yeah. She's learned a real hard lesson on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but it must be, in the moment, must be hard to make those sorts of decisions if you're not used to being confronted with something like that where you've got that determination. Yeah, well, and yeah. I think for me, yeah. I've I've been in the range when the weather goes bad yeah. and it's a terrifying experience. Yeah. And so you can really hear that. I can really hear that in her voice, that it was scary, and yeah, that's and that's important, isn't it, to be able to have those kinds of sound bites in a documentary like this are really crucial. So there's, there's a lot around that, isn't there, about creating an interview environment that people feel able to be that vulnerable or honest. Yeah, look, I was really, imp- I was so impressed and very grateful that people really everybody really got into it and everybody who was interviewed they love adventuring they love the the sk it's i think it comes naturally for them to be connected and engaged with it i think we've got really strong characters inside of the inside of the documentary and the, I think we chose those people because they wanted to be involved, but also because they were they're great characters, which is another important point too. Yeah, <laughs> you've got a, a good, great story, good characters, and yeah, yeah. So mm. I, when I was first planning the film, I identified Tim as being an absolute the. I knew Tim would make a great character and so I he was the first person I reached out to to ask if he'd be willing to be involved because I knew that having a strong character like that would really make it great Hmm. and Dave Kappa was I didn't know Dave Dave became a really important character a really strong character in the film as well yeah 
Mm. It provides provide that 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 wisdom, that long term sort of insight. yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, it was really crucial. It's really nice to to hear him speak and his, you know, like you say, his wisdom and his passion mm. was was very engaging. Mm. Cool. Should we do the outro? Yeah. Okay, so the first so, line is yours. First line is mine. Okay, this is the outro. Okay. And that wraps up the making of the Tatarua SK. We hope you enjoy the stories from the Tatarua, the filmmaking challenges, and everything in between. I'll do that one more time. And that wraps up the making of the Tatarua SK. We hope you enjoy this. <laughs> and that wraps up the making of the Tatarua SK. We hope you enjoyed the stories from the Tararua, the filmmaking challenges and everything in between. Be sure to check out Tararua SK at tararuask.com. Also screening on Apple TV, Prime Video and in New Zealand. Thanks for joining us. What's your next adventure? Boom. Done. <laughs>